Welcome to Telltale Books video. I'm Greg and I am putting this video on YouTube for the in honor of the birth date of Robert E. Howard, which I hope you all know. If you don't know, Robert E. Howard is the creator and writer of all the best Conan the Barbarian stories published mostly in Weird Tales back in the 1930s. That's his biggest claim to fame. He wrote a lot of other pulp adventure fiction back then. He died, I believe, in 38 or something like that. Let me look at, look at my notes. He died in 1936. He was only 30 years old. He's from Texas. Peaster, Texas. Not sure where that is. But he's a Texan. And very, very well known. He is one of the superstars of fantasy fiction. Today's fantasy fiction can be um, traced from three sources. One, of course, is all the fairy tales. Grimm's fairy tales, Hans Christian Andersen. That's where a lot of fantasy story has its start. And today we have a lot of people rewriting fairy tales. That's a very big deal for fantasy authors today is to take those old fairy tale stories like Cinderella or Beauty and the Beast and, and rewrite them into modern fiction. Another source of inspiration is Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, which of course traces back to the ancient epics like Beowulf or um, the Icelandic epics, or even the Iliad and the Odyssey by Homer. And the third major track for fantasy is the sword and sorcery genre that Robert E. Howard almost invented. I, I don't know if it's completely accurate to say that he invented it, but that's generally what I hear is that there wasn't anybody before him. I mean, you can probably you could probably argue that writers like H. Ryder Haggard and Edgar Rice Burroughs predate Robert E. Howard, but they weren't doing quite the same thing as what Conan did. And so that whole track leads to the sword and sorcery stories that we have today and, and ultimately a lot of the Dungeons and Dragons type um, fantasy adventure that we have today. So uh, I don't have Howard's first six works. They were not fantasy. They were not science fiction. They were not published in the genre magazines. I believe they were all published in his high school magazine. So they were teen works. They were amateur works. And so I'm going to start if I ever get a hold of those stories, I will double back and, and cover those, but I don't have them, so I can't read them, and I can't report on them, because I know nothing about them. All I know is they weren't fantasy. So I'm going to start with Robert E. Howard's first sale to Weird Tales magazine, which it appeared in the July 1925 issue of Weird Tales, and it's titled Spear and Fang. Now, I don't have this in a book either. I got nothing I can hold up. I was able to find a PDF for free on the internet and I, I'll, I'll post an image of the cover, although it has nothing to do with the story Spear and Fang, but I'll put that up so you can appreciate that. Um, so this was Robert E. Howard's first story and it's, it's just a short story. It's a little thing. And the basic synopsis, this is a a story about cavemen, okay? So kind of, sort of, the heroic fantasy type theme, but not really. It was more about prehistory, more kind of like some of the stuff Burroughs had written. I believe by this time he had written his uh, some of his books that took place in prehistory. So he was probably influenced by some of those sorts of things. And what's happening here, this is something you see a lot in fiction. We've, we've, I've already covered a couple of 
of stories where Neanderthal men figure prominently. The Day is Done by Lester Del Rey is an amazing example of that kind of uh, trope in both fantasy and science fiction. And The Gnarly Man by El Sprague de Camp has a Neanderthal man that's still alive today in, well, in the time in the today of when the story was published 1939 but in this one we go all the way back the story is set in prehistory where Cro-Magnon man is on the scene as and it's told from the viewpoint you know and it's it's told third person but from kind of hanging with the Cro-Magnon people and the Neanderthals are their enemies the Neanderthals are pictured which I'm pretty sure scientists today would tell you is inaccurate. But this may have been what scientists of 1925 believed, and that is that the Cro-Magnons were were very ape-like. They were cannibalistic. They were animalistic. They, They were not men. They were not really intelligent. They were slightly better than animals. And they were very strong and very brutish, and when they came across any Cro-Magnons, they right away uh, went after them, captured them, and ate them. So, while you have a a woman, Cro-Magnon woman, she's kind of forced into the woods by this other Cro-Magnon man that wants to mate with her, but she doesn't like him. She likes this other guy who isn't, uh, he's like an artist. He does cave paintings. <clears throat> but the, but the, the first guy drags her off into the woods and, and attempts to rape her, but some Neanderthals come along. They rip him to shreds and they capture the girl. Well, the other Cro-Magnon, the artist Cro-Magnon, he sees footprints leading into the woods and he follows them and realizes there's also Neanderthal footprints. And so he, he keeps following and he comes to where the Neanderthals are, where they have the girl held captive. And, well, of course, he saves the day. I'm sorry to spoil it for you. <clears throat> This is a simple story. The characters are pretty simple. We don't get deep into psyche here. It's an action-adventure story. Kind of slightly horror story because the Neanderthals are portrayed in a very horrific manner. But not really a horror story. More, more, I, you know... This kind of story, because it's utilizing what we've learned from paleontology, it's utilizing science to try to paint a picture of what the world was like back then. But it's also fantasy in that the stories usually involves subjects that are more typical of stories like Conan the Barbarian. So these kinds of prehistoric stories, they they don't fit perfectly in with the science fiction canon, and they don't fit perfectly in with the fantasy canon. They kind of are a thing unto their own. But they do... This story, anyway, this definitely belongs in a magazine like Weird Tales. It, it is kind of weird. It is kind of terrifying. And, you know, like I say, it's a simple adventure story. It's a, it's a pretty short story, so it doesn't get into a lot of details of anything. You don't have intense world building. You don't have intense character here. You just have a, a simple fantasy story. This, this could have been expanded to detail more of these Cro-Magnon's lives or, or maybe even get into the Neanderthals deeper. But then it wouldn't have been a short story and he would have had to try and publish it somewhere else probably. I don't know. Anyway, <clears throat> the, 
this this definitely is not mature Robert E. Howard. It definitely is not what fantasy fans would look for today. It's not a deep story, but it's it's very short, easy read, not going to take up much of your time. So if you're interested, it's a good story. It's not badly written. It's okay. It's not great. This isn't a top tale. There's nothing great about this story, but it's it's fun. It's interesting. It's it's worth the I think I spent 15 minutes reading it. It's worth it. Um, but I guess I would only recommend it to the Robert E. Howard completist. Because you, you're not going to get the same kind of thing that you love about Khan and the Barbarian out of this story. It's much more simple than that. So have you read Spear and Fang? What did you think of it? Leave your comments. Leave any other comments you have about Robert E. Howard. And come on back for more. I'm going to continue. I'm going to try to get a hold of and read everything I can by Robert E. Howard and go through in order of publication. And I hope you'll join me. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button. And I'll be here doing these. <laughs>